musicians are all getting ready to play, but look, in the interest of time, we're going to dispense with our second hymn. And uh, this is probably a good day to share something that's short and simple, isn't it? Eh? Probably about time I preached something that was short and simple. Some of you, I'm sure some of you are thinking that. But All right, well, look, um, I'm gonna, I am going to share something that's a little different from the what, what I usually share, or the way I usually share it. I like to take a passage of Scripture and unpack it and, and, and dig deep. Um, but I want to I share something, I guess, just from my heart, from some, some texts of Scripture. And uh, I've, got a, I've got a PowerPoint. We'll get that on the screen as well. If you've got your Bible, take your Bible and turn with me to Romans chapter 12. And our key text this morning is Romans chapter 12 and verse 3. Romans chapter 12 and verse 3. And it says, well, Paul is saying here, he says, For I say, through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. I want to reflect on that a little bit this morning. And I've called the message, you see it there on the screen, Think Soberly, Achieve Unity. And you might think, ah, oh, it's not that simple. Unity takes a lot more than just thinking soberly. But I want to share with you some thoughts from Scripture that... Uh, might change your mind. Let's bow our heads and we'll just ask for the Spirit to guide us as we open the Word together. Let's, let's pray. Father in heaven, we, we thank you for condescending to meet with us again this morning. Thank you for the message that you have placed within the pages of this holy book for us to challenge us, to change us, to make us like Jesus. Father, I pray that as we read, as we study together this morning, that your spirit would soften our hearts, that you would make us aware of our need, and you would show us the steps that we can take to become more like Jesus, to be humble as he was humble. And we ask for your blessing to that end, please, in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's, let's begin our, our study, actually, by going to Philippians. We're going to come back to Romans. I want to unpack that passage a little bit more. But I want to lay a bit of a, a foundation, I guess, just provide a bit of context for where we want to go. And I want you to turn with me to Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1. And just want to share with you a couple of thoughts. Thoughts that I think were important to the Apostle Paul. And I would argue that if Paul were here today, and not just in Rockhampton, I'm not picking on us here in Rockhampton, but if he were in Yapoon or in Brisbane or anywhere in Australia, probably anywhere in the world, he would say something very similar. Philippians chapter 1 and verse 27. Philippians chapter 1 and verse 27. He says, only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ. So that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Now this is, this is citizenship language. Philippi was, uh, was part of... Um, the Roman Empire was under Roman rule and they were expected to act as Roman citizens and the, the citizens of Philippi would have known very clearly what was expected of them and what were their obligations under that Roman rule. And you would have meant to be a citizen of the Roman Empire. And Paul takes that idea and he says to them, conduct yourselves not just worthy of Roman citizenship, 
but worthy of the gospel of Christ. You take the name of Jesus. You profess to have accepted the gospel. I want to hear that you are living in a way that reflects that profession, in a way that is worthy of the calling that you have responded to. What does he say? He says, I want to hear that you are standing fast, all right? You're remaining faithful. But not just faithful as independent atoms. Not just faithful as, as, a, as a group of, of individual Christians, but faithful in unity, faithful in harmony, faithful as a, as a corporate body. One spirit, he says, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. I like the way the NIV puts it, says, striving as one man for the faith of the gospel. And I, and I think of, for some reason, when I, when I, when I read that, I, I think of tug of war. You, you, know, you know, you go to the well, agricultural shows, and often there's a tug of war competition, you know, and there's a team of guys on, on one side of the rope pulling against a team of guys on the other side of the rope. And there's something in the middle that, that marks the, the center and the, guy, the, the goal is to pull in your direction so that the other guys are thrown off balance and, and that little mark comes over your line and you win. All right? And if you, if you ever watch those guys, as a kid I used to just, it just amaze me because you know, these big, strong, tough guys and as a, as a little boy you wanted to be big and strong and so I used to stand in awe of these guys. But you would hear there was usually one guy who was kind of like the, the, the foreman or the boss or the leader, whatever he was. And he would call for them to pull. And they'd, they'd be, the, the idea was that they would pull in unison. They would take the strain together and they would pull together in order to place maximum um, pressure on that rope and on the other team and so win the tug-of-war contest. And when I read this, striving as one man, striving together for the face of faith of the gospel, I think of a group of people pulling together, pulling in the same direction, pulling with the same goal as a team. That's what Paul had in mind for the church. I said not just our church, but the, the, the Christian church, the Adventist church. Unity, people working together, striving together with a common goal, He touches on it here in verse 27 and he picks it up again in verse in chapter 2. And we'll unpack this, then we'll get back to Romans 12 and I'll just share a few closing thoughts. But in, in Philippians chapter 2, he comes back to this thought of unity and he says, Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy. Make, make my joy complete. Make me happy. Right? Make me as happy as I can be. By being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. What's he saying there? It's a pretty challenging, when you, when you break it down, it's a pretty challenging statement. What he's saying there in verse 1 is, is if Christ means anything to you, if, if there's any value to you in, in having experienced the love of God, if, if there's any significance in having received the Holy Spirit, if that matters to you at all, if that has any meaning and any value, then show that. Show that by being unified, being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. And, and most of you sitting here, if you're like me, would say, well, of course, that's, that's my goal. That's what I'd love to see happen. If only everyone just thought a little bit more like I did, it would be easy. The problem is people don't see things the way I see them. People have these different views, and that creates the problem. And of course, you know, there's an, an understanding, I think an assumption here on Paul's part that we do believe the same things. As a Seventh-day Adventist, we're here, we believe in the Sabbath, we believe in the state of the dead, we, we believe in the teachings of Scripture. Now we sometimes understand and apply what we believe slightly differently. But Paul doesn't point to, to our beliefs and our understandings as the key to unity. 
he, is, he assumes that. He points to something else. He points to something else. He says in verse 3, Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. See, the issue is not the truth. The truth is important. The truth is essential. When it comes to unity, we can all believe the truth and still not get along. Funny how that happens, isn't it? It's not about conformity or uniformity. As I said, we can all look the same, talk the same, eat the same and still find reasons to not get along. The issue is one of attitude. As Paul presents this challenge to us, he says it's about attitude. It's about your attitude, it's about my attitude. And if we were to sum it up in a word, it would be an attitude of humility. The New King James says, In lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. A more contemporary version would say, be humble. Be humble about your own abilities, about your own importance, about your own perspective. And consider others. Consider others, not just yourself. It was a problem in the Christian church, it's not just here in Philippi, and, and, and just really, really quickly, if you, if you hold your finger there and go over to 1 Corinthians. Uh, this was obviously a burden on Paul's heart as he heard reports from different churches. It taxed him, you know, he was, he was instrumental in founding a number of these churches. And he would get reports that there were divisions taking place within the churches and he would respond, and I want you to just see this really quickly, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 10. 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 10. He says, Now I plead with you, brethren. This is not just a passing comment. This is not just wishful thinking. He says, I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it's been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, by those of Chloe's household, that there are contentions among you. Paul received a report that there was division taking place within the Corinthian church and it troubled him and he pled with the Corinthians. Don't let it happen. Don't let it happen. Picks it up again in chapter 3. He says, I, brethren, could not speak to you as spiritual people, but as to carnal, as to babes in Christ. I fed you with milk and not with solid food, for until now you were not able to receive it. And even now you are still not able, for you are still carnal. Why does he come to that conclusion? He says, because where there are envy, strife and divisions among you, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? Division in the church is a sign of carnality, that the flesh has risen up in the lives and the hearts and the thinking of the members. And they've begun to act out of envy and strife. They've begun to act selfishly and indifferently to those around them. What's the solution? Well, humility. Philippians chapter 2. We just want to go back there real quick. Paul says in Philippians chapter 2, Don't do anything through selfish ambition or conceit. In humility of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Unity comes through humility. That's the point. Well, I don't have these points on the screen today. I'm going to put some stuff up on a minute that's slightly different. But if you want to take notes, the first key point is unity comes through humility. Unity comes through humility. Humility. 
If we want unity, if we want to just be able to get along, we have to have humility. And Paul says in verse 5, he says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. That's a familiar passage, isn't it? And we probably know that off by heart. We may not have recognized the context that Paul presents that. When he tells us to have the mind of Christ, there are some versions translated the attitude of Christ. It's in the context of achieving unity in the church. Let this mind be in you. Have this attitude among yourselves, as some translations put it. The same attitude which was also in Christ Jesus. What was his attitude? It says, Who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance of, of, as a man, what did he do? He humbled himself, became obedient to the point of death, even the death on the cross. The key character quality emphasized there in the life of Jesus was humility. Paul lifts up Jesus as an example of humility. He says, I want you to be unified. I want you to make my joy complete by, by getting on with each other, working together, striving as one man for the gospel. And the way to do that is, is, to, is to be humble, to have the mind of Christ, the attitude of Christ. He humbled himself. I want you to note the language there. Humility is not just something you wake up with one morning. It's an act of the will. It's a choice that you make. Jesus humbled himself. He took responsibility for his own attitude. And he didn't just think it, he acted on it. Became a servant. A servant to humanity. Now, in that context, I want to go back to Romans 12 and I want to finish with Paul's message in Romans 12 and see if we can make some practical application to it. Romans 12. If unity is through humility, where does humility come from? Well, it comes from the Spirit of Christ. But I want to see if we can, if we can find some, some practical steps here in Romans 12. Romans 12. You know, you know how it starts. You know this off by heart. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Do not be conformed to this world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. What's the will of God? The will of God is your sanctification, as each one of us should become holy and like Christ. But the will of God for us corporately is that as a church, we should function in harmony so that we can reflect the character of Christ to our community. How's it going to happen? Well... Verse 3, I say, through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly. And that's that idea of humility again. Humility. Now, Paul's going to tell us how that happens. You know, when I came into the church, I came back into the church in my early 20s, and I've shared some of this in the past. I, I um, had left the church in my teens, came back when I was 21, 22 years old, and I'd been reading Desire of Ages, reading The Great Controversy, reading my Bible. I came back all, all zealous and enthusiastic and, and, and on fire and um, ran into the church. And I felt like I didn't fit in. I felt like I didn't fit in. I didn't see things the way other people in the church saw things. The other people in the church didn't see things the way I saw things. And I began to get very disillusioned. What do I do? And I had people saying to me, hey, well, you know, come, to, come to this independent ministry camp meeting and there you'll find the truth and you'll find other people that, that see it the same way you do. And I was confused for, for a long time as to how I could reconcile what I thought was right with what other people seemed to think was right. And I want to share with you the conclusion that I came to. I want to share with you what helped me. And it's, it's really in this passage, if you, if you would keep going. Paul, Paul says here, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought to think. Don't, don't think that you're so important that you have all the answers, that, that yours is the only perspective. All right? But think soberly, and that's the title. Think soberly and achieve unity. But he goes on to tell us how to do that. He gives us some practical advice, and this is where we, we want to 
pull it together. For as we have many members in one body, but not all members have the same function. That's, that's us. You look at your body, you have lots of parts. They don't all do the same thing, do they? Eyes, ears, hands. So we being many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us. Let us use them of prophecy. Let us prophesy in proportion to our faith or ministry. Let us use it in our ministering. He who teaches in teaching, he who exhorts in exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. What does that mean? I want to share with you an illustration that I think will help us understand this. It's a poem that I came across some years ago, and you probably heard it, but I'll share it with you again because I think it's, it's got good, some good counsel in it. It's about six men who go to see an elephant. And seeing an elephant's kind of interesting thing to do, I guess. I've been to the zoo and I've, I've gone to see the elephants. The problem with these six men is that they're all blind. How do you see an elephant if you're blind? How do you see anything if you're blind? Well, these six men went to see the elephant. This is called the Six Blind Men of Hindustan, and, and I think you'll enjoy it. I'm going to put a picture on the screen so you know what we're talking about. We're talking about elephants. There were six men of Hindustan, to learning much inclined, who went to see the elephant, though all of them were blind, that each by observation might satisfy his mind. The first approached the elephant and happening to fall against his broad and sturdy side, at once began to bawl, why bless me, but the elephant is very like a wall. The second feeling of the tusk cried, ho, oh, what have we here? So very round and smooth and sharp, to me it is very clear. This wonder of an elephant is very like a spear. The third approached the animal and happening to take the squirming trunk within his hands, thus boldly up he spake, I see, quoth he, the elephant is very like a snake. The fourth reached out his eager hand and felt about the knee. What most this wondrous beast is like is very plain, quoth he. Tis clear enough, the elephant is very like a tree. The fifth, who chanced to touch the ear, said, Even the blindest man can tell what this resembles most. Deny the fact who can. This marvel of an elephant is very like a fan. The sixth, no sooner had begun about the beast to grope, than seizing on the swinging tail that fell within his scope, I see, quoth he, the elephant is very like a rope. And so these men of Hindustan disputed loud and long, each in his own opinion, exceeding stiff and strong, though each was partly in the right and all were in the wrong. Interesting story, isn't it? What's that about? It's about human nature, isn't it? Do any of us see the whole elephant? When it comes to life, when it comes to, to, to church, when it comes to theology and, and, and faith and practice, do any of us see the whole elephant? Do any of us know all there is to know? We don't, do we? And so it is fitting that we should be humble in the way that we present our own opinions and the way that we respond to the opinions of others. Now, how does that reflect in the church? All right, I, want to, I want to take that idea. All right? We've got six blind men who go to see the elephant. In Romans 12, we've got six, sorry, seven spiritual gifts. And I want to give you a hypothetical situation. This is an illustration. This is not a sermon on spiritual gifts or what they mean or what they represent. But I want to present a hypothetical situation that I think will help us understand how these things function in the church. Seven Christians meet, meet together to organize the ideal church. All right? Maybe you're one of them. Each Christian represents a different spiritual gift. What, what would they say would be the most important thing that the church would need. All right? Seven Christians representing these seven different spiritual gifts. We just read through them. Prophecy, um, ministry or, or serving, teaching, exhortation, um, giving, leading or, or uh, organization, mercy. All right? Seven Christians, each representing a different gift. 
Planning the perfect church. What's the prophet going to say? All right, think of Jeremiah, all right? What's, what's the greatest need of the church? The greatest need, according to the prophet, would be well-prepared sermons, exposing sin, proclaiming righteousness and warning of judgment to come. That's what the church needs, isn't it? Of course it is. But if you're a server, all right, say, say you represent the spiritual gift of serving and you're asked the same question. What do we need as we plan the ideal church? What is the greatest thing our church needs? A server has a different perspective. A server says, well, we, we need practical assistance to a member of the church to encourage them and help them to fulfill their responsibilities. A server will see practical needs that the prophet won't see. The prophet sees sin and righteousness. But the server sees practical needs. People need help. They need, they need to have their needs met, and the church should be set up to do that. If we're not doing that, we're falling short as a church. Now, what about the teacher? The teacher says, no, 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 no. Those two things, they're not the most important things that the church needs. All right? What the church needs is, is, is solid Bible study. We need to be digging deep into Scripture. We need to be wrestling with, with the text, understanding what it means. If we don't do that, we're just going to be lost at sea. We're just going to be substituting experience for sound doctrine and we've really got to focus on, on the Bible. That's what our church really needs. And then the exhorter comes along. The exhorter is an encourager. All right? The exhorter comes along and he says, no, those, those three things are not that important really. What we really need is personal counselling and encouragement for every member to assist them in applying scriptural principles to their daily living. The exhorter wants to see people grow spiritually. We should be growing and mature. We shouldn't be content to be where we are. We've got to be growing. We should be finding ways to encourage people and, and help them in their spiritual journey. And then the giver comes along. And the giver says, no, 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 no. Those, those four things, they're, they're, they're good, but, but, but we could do without those. What the, the most important thing is, is that we, we, we give sacrificially. We, we, need to be, we need to be trusting God for our finances and, and being aware of the, the financial needs that are out there and saving for these, these missionaries and other ministries. That, that's, that's really what God wants us to do. And then the organiser comes along and he says, well, you know, all those things are great, but, but without good organisational structures, without things that are planned and run decently, and all, nothing's going to work anyway. So really the most important thing is that we have smooth running organisation right throughout the church. And then, of course, there's the last one, the gift of mercy. And the gift of, someone with the gift of mercy is sensitive to people who are hurting, people who are in pain. And so the person with the gift of mercy says, boy, you guys, you guys are all totally missed the point. You don't even care about people. The, the real issue is the people who are hurting. The church should be set up in order to meet the needs of, of people who are hurting and in pain. Now, who's right? Which, which one of those is right? Well, the, the answer depends on which part of the elephant you've grasped, doesn't it? You see? They, they are all right. They are all right, but they have a different perspective. And the problem is that when, when we, we come to church and we all have our, our unique perspective, all right, and God's gifted us in different ways, different things stand out to us. Something that stands out to me doesn't stand out to you. And so when I come and say, look, the problem with the church is that everybody's just compromising with the world. That's the problem. We've got to fix that. If we could just fix that and get people committed and, and, and cut their ties with the world and be faithful to Christ, man, this church would be flying. You know, God would bless us and it'd be on fire. All right? That's what Jeremiah would say, wouldn't he, you know? Get rid of the idols. God will bless you. But then the, uh, the server would say, no, the problem with the church is that people's needs are being overlooked. There are people out here who have needs and we don't even care about them. That's the real problem. If we could fix that, then, then man, this church would be just on fire. And, and so it would go on. God has put different gifts within the church for a reason, hasn't he? And I think a big part of it is to teach us humility. If we are going to experience unity with our diversity of perspectives or our diversity of gifts, we need to learn to be humble. Three things. I just, this is just going to finish with this. Just if you, if you want to make some, some notes, 
We said, first of all, unity is through humility. Where does humility come from? I'm going to give you three things. Humility comes through, number one, recognising my own limitations. Humility comes from recognising my own limitations. Like the blind men with the elephant. I only see part of the picture. My perspective is incomplete. My perspective is limited, my abilities are limited, my knowledge is limited. And for me to say, this is how it is, or this is how it should be, is just not appropriate, is it? Because I don't know enough to be able to say that. So humility comes, number one, through recognising my own limitations. Number two, humility comes through valuing the contribution of others. Valuing the contribution of others. Six blind men from Hindustan went to see the elephant. If, if, if they if, would just shut their mouths for a minute and listen to what the others were saying, they might have learned something, mightn't they? They, they would have realised that they'd only seen part of the picture, that only grabbed part of the elephant. Yes, the elephant was like a tree, but that's just the leg. There's another part of the elephant that's slightly different. But I'm not going to find that out if I'm busy pushing my own perspective and not listening to what somebody else has to say. All right? And when I came into the church in my early 20s, I had my perspective, and my perspective was right. I knew it was right. No doubt in my mind. I could see what all the problems were. I knew I had to be able to fix it. End of story. Do you think I fit it in well? Do you think I was easy to get along with? No. I was arrogant. I was self-righteous. No one said that to me, but I know they were saying it about me. People, people told me that. And as I, as I began to read this, I, 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 sometime later in my journey, I, I was challenged with this teaching on spiritual gifts. And I began to realise that there are at least six other perspectives that I didn't have. And, and the perspective that others in the church had was just as valid as mine was. Just as valid. And I, I had been so quick to condemn I, I, there were people in the church I had written off. They were never going to make it into the kingdom. And I began to realise that they were simply seeing a different part of the elephant. They had different abilities, different talents, different gifts than what I had, and they had a different perspective. And I was humbled. I was humbled. I was, I was convicted. And I had to get on my knees and repent and tell the Lord how sorry I was for being so arrogant and self-righteous. I still battle with it. We all still battle with it. But humility comes through recognising my own limitations, the limitations of my perspective, my abilities and my knowledge, and valuing the contribution of others. I, I had a lot to learn as a new Christian. I still have a lot to learn. All of us, don't we? We've still, we've still got a little way to go. But I've learned to value the contribution of others. Other people see things that I don't see. They have gifts that I don't have. And together, we reflect the character of Christ. Together, we reflect the character of Christ. That's a profound thought, isn't it? Finally, and the last thought I want to share, and I'm not just saying this because nominating committee is coming up, but I, I think based on the text, it says there in verse 6, Romans 12, Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. Now, that's in italics. It's supplied, but it's intended from the text. All right? It is false humility that says my gifts are not important. Other people are more important than me and I don't have to get involved. I can sit back and let the talented people do the work. You've heard of that 80-20 rule? 80% 80, 80 of the people sitting back watching 20% of the people do the work. Uh, it's not just a church problem, it's a problem in all of society. It's a human nature problem. But part of that comes from this false sense of humility. Well, I don't really have anything to contribute. Well, the Bible says you do. God says you do. And when you withdraw, when you say, no, I'm, I'm not going to get involved. I'm too, too busy 
too young, too old, too tired, too inexperienced, too, too experienced, whatever, you are withholding from the body of Christ the gift that God has given you. Now, sure, some of us have, have more upfront roles, some of us have more behind-the-scenes roles, and we're gifted in different ways. Some of us don't have the experience that is necessary to carry certain responsibilities. But I would suggest that, that humility is through recognising your own limitations. It is also valuing the contribution of others. But it is also, thirdly, through using my gifts to contribute to the ministry of the church. Um, Ephesians 4, it says that God gave gifts for the edifying of the body of Christ. Now, I can misuse my gifts and I can actually tear down the body of Christ. I can, there's plenty of good ways to misuse gifts. I could preach a whole sermon on misusing the gifts that God has given you. I'm good at doing that. But the purpose of the gifts, if they're used correctly, is to build up the body of Christ, to build up the church. Am I making a positive contribution to the life of the church? Am I contributing? Maybe just a small way. You know, we talked about the talents some weeks ago. Some have five talents, some have two, some have one. It was a man with the one talent that got in the most trouble. Because he looked at his one talent and he said, what do I have to offer? I'm just going to bury it in the ground. Don't do that. Don't bury your talent. All right? Ask yourself, what can I do? How can I make a contribution? Unity is through Humility. Humility is through recognising my own limitations, valuing the contribution of others, and using the gifts that I do have to make a positive contribution to the ministry of the church. Let's, let's sing our closing hymn together. Father in heaven, we, we just bow humbly before you. We confess to you the selfishness and the pride that springs so naturally from our hearts. Amen. Father, you know the, the attitudes that have, that have driven us, the motives that have caused us to, to speak and to act the way we have. You know the times, Lord, when, when I and probably many of us here have prayed, Lord, if only people were more like me, we'd all just get along so much better. 
Father, forgive us for being so arrogant. Forgive us for being so self-righteous. Father, help us to strive together as one man for the faith of the gospel. Help us to be pulling together in the same direction, pulling in unity, pulling in harmony. Father, we recognise that's only going to happen as we humble ourselves. May we have the mind of Christ. May his attitude be ours. May we be willing to step down to put aside our own interests and look out for the interests of others. And Father, as we've considered this morning this idea of giftedness, of different perspectives, different abilities, help us to recognise our own limitations. Remind us when we, when we attempted to be arrogant to, to remember that we don't see the full picture but father to make us mindful that others have something valuable to contribute and that we too have a gift a talent that we can use for the building up of the body of christ bless us to that end i pray make us like jesus both individually and corporately i pray for his sake amen